Welcome to the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number 19, Enlightenment and Global Poverty. Okay, we're recording this on September 9, uh, 5th, 2017, and this particular episode is not going to be about individual enlightenment as much as collective enlightenment, how enlightened we are as a world. I'll be doing a series on this um, you know, I mean, we, we are enlightened in a lot of ways, and a lot of people are doing really well. Um, we value goodness, we value ethics, we try to create a, a better world, but, you know, we're far from perfect, and in this area of global poverty, we really need to, to become more enlightened. Um, so, like, you know, enlightenment isn't all about happiness, you know, happiness is a very important component of it, you know, both individually and collectively. It's also, though, about goodness. It's about compassion. Um, if we're very happy, but we're not that good, not good at all, or not compassionate, that's, that's not really being enlightened. And um, so, you know, and then this, all right, with this episode and a few others that are following this one on animal rights and abortion, etc., um, it's important to note that this isn't about feeling guilty. Okay, you know, it's not, we don't have a free will. What we do is not up to us. You know, the God, the, the, the higher power that created the world, that created us basically makes us do or not do whatever God wants us to do or not do. And then, you know, perhaps unfairly, certainly unfairly, it seems, um, when we do something wrong, we get punished. Uh, so that's the first point is like, you know, we shouldn't feel guilty about this because it's really not our fault. But that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything about it because... Because even though, you know, what we do is not up to us, even though we don't have a free will, when we do things that are good, God does reward us. God makes us happy. God m makes us prosper, you know, keeps us healthy. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we, when we don't do what's good, then God uh, punishes us. And, um, and there's two ways of, of, of being punished. One is the kind of punishment that we experience as individuals. And the other kind of punishment is what we feel collectively, um, what we might consider perhaps was responsible for, let's say, the, the, the two world wars and the civil war and, and these, these calamities, these tragedies, this affect us, affect, you know, all, much of the world or now with climate change, actually, you know, all the world. So, so this is about a kind of co collective punishment that we really want to avoid. <clears throat> um, all right, and also relative to this matter of free will, um, it's important to understand that um, one of the reasons there is global poverty, and, and, and I'll get into the numbers um, in a bit, is that, um, is that People in rich countries like the United States and you know, a lot of rich countries in Europe and throughout the world blame poor people for being poor. You know, they say, well, these, 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 these uh, people should be more industrious, they're, they're lazy, they just don't want to work. And first of all, to a great extent, that's not true. A lot of the, the poverty in this world um, has to do, for example, in, in the West with colonialism, um, but it's it certainly like you know, much of the poverty in the world isn't because people are lazy and don't want to work, it's because the jobs aren't there, because the, um, there's a certain manner, level of unfairness in our global economy that's been that way for hundreds of years. I mean, like, look about, um, consider Africa, uh, one of the poorest regions, probably the poorest region in the world. Um, you know, they had hundreds of years of slavery where they were basically, you know, the people were just extracted from from that land and you know people along the coast where the civilizations are and they just they never had the chance to develop their economies because they were so oppressed by slavery and by uh, colonization you know by this imperialism of um you know british imperialism um american imperialism so 
So this idea of blaming the poor for their poverty is, is mistaken on two counts. One, they don't have a free will. You know, they're born into those countries. They're born into those situations um, on three counts, actually. Two, you know, the poverty that, that exists in this world is not because people are, are lazy or not industrious. It's because of these geopolitical, these, these, these global kinds of economic issues. And, uh, it, you know, <clears throat> basically countries imposing certain kinds of... Um, conditions on other countries. And third, um, because, um, well, all right, I've, um, all right, let's get, let's get into, um, let's get into the, the numbers. Um, one, one thing you hear is that um, the world is becoming less poor, that, um, that basically, we are, we're making strides in global poverty, and yes and no, okay? Um, China, as China has developed its economy, it has lifted millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, about 300 million. Um, that's good. Um, we are making progress, but the problem is that relative to our population growth as a world, we're really not making progress. Um, for example, um, right, right now, uh, a billion people live in, in, in extreme poverty, um, close to a billion, maybe 900 um, million or so. And, um, and it's a bigger world. Like 20 years ago, you know, a billion people lived in poverty, but there were, there were fewer people on the planet. You know, so, like, so basically you have to like consider this um, relative to the, the global population, the total population. So, um, and in terms of the extent of the problem, um, you've got every day 20 to 30,000 children under the age of five die of these largely preventable poverty-related causes. Um, unsafe drinking water, malaria, malnutrition. You know, these are, these are conditions that are treatable, you know, if, if people cared, if people cared enough to, to help them. So you have 20 to 30 children, 1,000 children under five dying every day of these preventable, largely preventable poverty-related causes, and that amounts to about like, well, eight to ten million of these children dying every year. Okay, so this is, you know, this is, this is horrible. This is like, you know, th that our world is still like this, you know, um, is, is beyond belief. It's funny because like, you know, uh, when Trump was campaigning, he was saying like, make America great again. Um, you know, it's not to single out America, but like America and the rest of the world, I'm not sure we've ever been great. You know, um, before several decades ago, there was segregation. Black people couldn't vote. Before that, there was slavery. Before that, we exterminated the, the, um, the Native Americans. So, so no, America has never been great. Our, our, our world, you know, has never been great. Perhaps we, we might eventually become great, but... Um, but it's just a mistake to, to consider ourselves great when, when we have abused, have oppressed, have, have really been so cruel to so many people over our history, and, and this continues regardless of how rich we become. Um, so, okay, um, now, this is not just about those poor people, you know, and, and they're mainly concentrated in Asia, Africa, and South America. Um, it's not just about them. It, it's, it's about the entire world. To the extent that we are so unenlightened, so callous, so cruel, so indifferent, that we refuse to help these people, because we really are refusing, I'll, I'll get into it in, in a bit, um, we are threatening ourselves. Again, you know, um, let me address the 90% of us 
who uh, believe in God or who believe in a, a higher power, okay, if, if we have these beliefs, like 90% of us here in the United States do, we understand that, that God, you know, judges us. And yes, you know, um, the caveat here is, yes, it's unfair. You know, we don't have a free will. God makes us do what we do and then either rewards or punishes us, right? That's, that's the reality. But notwithstanding, the, the, the fact is that when we don't do as we should be doing, um, we suffer consequences. Again, it, it's probably not coincidental that the Civil War and the world wars um, from the America standpoint were related to, to our treatment of, of black people and of Native Americans. Um, in today's world, um, and it's not just the global poverty, it's like, you know, we, we lose, um, well, the, the, the figure of about 10 um, million a year is just children under five. There's, so, there's also some adults, maybe like perhaps closer to 20 million altogether per year for, for poverty, but it's, it's not just that. Uh, we lose 50 million, 50 to 60 million people each year to abortion. And you know, this, I'm gonna do a show on this. It'll be a bit difficult because I tend to be a very extreme liberal but this is the one issue that I, um, that I disagree with, with the liberals about. You know, we need to find a way to, to end abortion. Um, I don't think Republicans have the answer. I think the, the Republican politicians just use that issue to basically, you know, deceive religious people into thinking that they care, but they, they really don't because if they did care, you know, they've had five justices on the Supreme Court that could have reversed Roe v. Wade years ago, you know, for the last 40, 45 years, they haven't. So, but that's a major issue. And the last issue that, um, that demonstrates the, our lack of enlightenment, I'll do a show on it, is um, our treatment of animals. You know, 60, 70 billion animals that we essentially torture each year in, in, in factory farms, in, in, in um, medical labs. Um, all right, so, so the idea behind this is that, you know, it's not as if this enlightenment is just for the, the sake of the poor in this case, just for the sake of people who shouldn't be dying, who shouldn't be suffering and, and getting these horrible diseases simply because the world is structured in such a way where s some rich people are too callous, too greedy, too selfish to help them. This is really about us, um, basically about everyone. Um, if, if we believe in a God that judges us, you know, that, that like rewards us when we do good and punishes us when we don't do good, well, then all we have to do to understand what our punishment will be is to look at climate change. All right, climate change is gonna be with us for decades and, um, and it, it could already be too late. There's a tipping point in climate change where like once the temperature and the CO2 concentrations get to a certain level, it doesn't matter what we do. You know, it just doesn't matter how much we cut after that, this, this, these feedbacks, this, this momentum has been, you know, started and will, it'll continue to get hotter and hotter each year, each decade, you know, until um, most of the world is, is a wasteland because you can't grow food in this, these extreme temperatures and you can't live in these extreme temperatures and the water will become scarce. Um, it's not just that, it's like the hurricanes, for example, we just had a, a horrible hurricane that hit Houston. Um, some people say, well, no, these hurricanes aren't related to climate change. That, yes, they are. It's, the idea is that generally, it's not that we have more hurricanes, but we actually do. Um, also, it's like, but, but generally, we don't have more hurricanes. They're, they're, they're generally stronger, though. You know, they, they're, they're more powerful. They, they have a lot more water in them, so they cause a lot more da damage. And actually, I think we do have more hurricanes because what happens is that the, the storms that in a milder climate would be simply tropical storms wouldn't reach the level of hurricanes because of the warmer temperatures, they do reach the hurricane intensity. So, so again, with, with, with climate change, when, when we consider global poverty, what we're looking at is because we're not doing what we should be doing, because we're not compassionate, if we, if we have a, a theistic, a, a religious perspective, 
If, if we're, you know, collectively we're rewarded or punished based on what we do or we don't do, you know, I'm not sure we can reasonably, you know, ethically expect anything different. Um, so, so that's, that's the thing. So like, you know, before, you know, 30 years ago, for example, when they first um, were beginning to appreciate the, the seriousness of climate change, this was something that was going to affect people's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Okay, in today's world, it's no longer like, like that. And in 2017, you know, if you have a, a child that's born this year, they are going to be about 30 years old in 2050. And in 2050, you know, the, the world is predicted to be much hotter, much less ho hospitable because of climate change. And that's just when they're 30. I mean, like by the time they're 60 and people may be living much longer, you know, during um, around 2080, it'll, it'll be much more severe. So basically my point is that, um, that addressing this global poverty is not just a matter of like our being kind to them and doing the right thing for their benefit. It really is uh, an existential in terms of civilization matter for us. We're not going to like, um, there's been predictions where like we're about 7.5 billion people on the planet today. Our numbers could be easily reduced to far less than a billion, you know, hundreds of millions, perhaps less because of this climate change. And it's not just the climate. You have, what, you have, what you have to understand is that as the resources dwindle, as, as you know, countries are, you know, water becomes scarce, energy becomes scarce and all, food becomes scarce, then there's geopolitical conflict. And, and you know, in, in today's highly technological world, it doesn't take a country to invade another country to wreak havoc on the whole, whole world. Um, if you've done any research on cyber threats, cyber terrorism, cyber attacks, basically you could have one person with a computer anywhere in the world just basically um, uh, just ending the economy of any, of any country. I mean, like, you know, you get into the economic system, you get into the banks, you get into the infrastructure, the electricity, whatever. There's, there's so many ways where, where people could wreak havoc on, on a country as, as powerful as the United States, you know, and, and, and they, they, they're not even a country. So, so again, and, and the, what, what I'm trying to get across is that, um, that the global poverty issue is an issue of fairness. So if you create a, a world that's fair, that works for everyone, not just for the, the a few, then you don't have people resorting to, to this, what in their view is, is, is a righteous cause. You know, like for example, when, when we um, as a country went up against Great Britain in the Revolutionary War, we were saying, oh, they're, you know, we don't get enough representation, they're taxing us too highly, and we, we became militaristic, you know, we, we launched a revolution. So, you know, basically like, you know, not that much representation, high taxes is actually, they're trivial reasons, you know, compared to what the kinds of reasons people will have, you know, if, if we don't address climate change and also if we don't address the spiritual component of, 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 you know, making, of assuring finally that everyone is, is, um, is provided for on the planet, well fed, you know, proper water and all. All right, um, so in terms like there's myths about this global poverty. First of all, the, the first myth is that the United States does so much um, to, to, to help people in poor countries. We hardly do anything. I can't emphasize this more. And in 1970, the United Nations commissioned a study called the Pearson Study, Pearson Commission, out of Canada, and they were, they were consigned to determine what it would cost the 22 richest countries to solve this global poverty. This is 1970. And at that time, they decided, well, if each of the 22 richest countries would devote 0.7% of their gross domestic product, less than 1% of their annual gross domestic product to ending global poverty, it could be done, okay? The problem was in, in the now 40 years, um, going on 50 years since that, you know, the, all the countries of the world made this pledge, 
Uh, it hasn't been enacted, and the United States has actually been the, one of the stingiest among um, the 22 countries in fulfilling this, this goal. Um, a few of the Scandinavian countries have fulfilled it for several years, but the rest of the country hasn't. So this is, you know, when, when people say, oh, we're doing so much, no, we're hardly doing anything at all. It's kind of like when people, politicians tell you the climate change is, is not happening, you know, I think, I think they know better. I think they're, they're simply just lying to, to us, you know, um, for, for political reasons. Um, another reason why these countries are poor, much poorer than they should be, is because, you know, we, we, we tout free trade, that, you know, we, we want a free global, you know, economy, globalization. And to a great extent, all right, some of that is working, certainly. Some of that is alleviating poverty, but a lot of that is not. And, for example, one of the things we do uh, as a rich country, um, we do this, European countries do this. We have trade alliances. We have trade agreements among the rich countries of the world that, let's say, we want to buy um, a product from England or Germany or France. We don't impose high tariffs on, you know, to trade with these, these um, countries because they're our trading partners, right? But if we want to buy products that, are, that would be much less expensive, actually, for us from countries in Africa or South America or, or parts of Asia, we, would, we're, we impose very high tariffs on those products. In other words, like in order for them to sell those products to us, they have to pay you know, uh, much higher rates, much higher tariffs than our much richer um, trading partners. So, so this, isn't, you know, this isn't just about um, not, um, not providing the, the economic means it, it's about it, it's a systematic structural you know basic uh, oppression of these countries it, it, it's 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 blatantly unfair um it's complete you know it, it's it's really inhumane you know, you know so anyway so what i'm trying to get across is that you know this this poverty is not you know due to just like well that's just the way things have always been this this modern global poverty is structural. It, it, it's designed this way. It's, you know, to a certain extent, you know, we in the richer countries want to keep those countries poorer so we can get less expensive products. Okay. Um, and again, it's greed, selfishness, callousness. So, all right. Um, we've got about four minutes left. Again, the, the, the big message here is like, you know, don't do it for them. If, if, if you have kids, if, if you want to have kids, if, you know, um, grandkids, um, do it for them because, like, you know, if, if you're, you know, like 90% of us and you believe in God and you believe that, that God rewards us when we do good and punishes us when we don't, you know, the, the, um, the evidence couldn't be clearer. You know, we're, we're allowing these kids under five to die at a rate of 20 to 30,000 every, every day. You know, that, that's insanely cruel, it's insanely callous. You know, it's, uh, it's horrible. Um, so what can we do? You know, this is like, that's, you know, talk about it. Um, give money if you have money. Get involved in some way. Um, back in 1984, I came up with this idea, you know, I was thinking about this problem. I was saying, well, you know, generally when we would go to a supermarket, we buy our products from very rich corporations you know, that actually don't care for our health, so we're actually getting sick because of the products, because they, you know, put too much salt in it, too much sugar, all this. But the, the, this idea that I came up with was that, well, instead of buying our food products and other products also from these rich corporations, let's buy them from companies, new companies that would be created to sell us products, and then rather than the profits from these products going to very rich people, rich stockholders, they could be used to end poverty, to, to fund medical research, to fu fund environmental protection, um, you know, have, have our profits from the products we, we, um, we create just serve the public good. Uh, basically, if you Google profit donation capitalism, uh, the site is still um, on there. Just, it's, it's the idea of, yes, when we buy, you know, we can, um, we can serve the, the greater good. Now, back in 84, when I came, when I, you know, this idea came to me, 
you know, I began to tell people about it and I quickly learned that Paul Newman had been doing this. You know, he, he formed the company in 1982. His purpose wasn't to really, you know, be charitable. He just wanted to sell a product, but they said, listen, if you're going to put your photo on it to sell it, you've got to give the profits away. But what he showed, you know, over the last 40 years or so, almost 40 years, 35, he's donated about half a billion dollars to thousands of charities through this model. Newman's own products, you know, you buy a product in the supermarket, the profits from that product after taxes don't go to rich stockholders, don't go to rich corporations. They get distributed among, you know, good causes, you know, causes that serve everyone. So that's just one idea. We have just over a minute left. Um, that's, you know, to talk about it, get involved, because like if, if you have kids, you know, this is, it's not about so much, I mean, if, if you're like 60 or 70 or 80, you don't have much longer to go, whatever, but your kids do. You know, if you care about your kids and if you believe that God holds us accountable for what we do, you know, um, if, to the extent that you ignore this global poverty, you're basically, you know, in the Bible says, well, God, you know, just like exacts vengeance on, on the generations, on, on generations of second, third, fourth generation of, of, of people, you know, like in other words, like God exacts vengeance on our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids. So, um, so again, if, if we don't have the, the wisdom, the compassion, uh, the goodness to help these people, you know, because it's the right thing to do, uh, then at the very least we should help them because, you know, it's in our interest, both, you know, because of climate change and because of the, uh, the kind of world that we're heading into, you know, that, that's fueled by this, this great um, callousness and difference. All right, so we will explore more topics on enlightenment, about enlightenment in future shows. Thanks for watching. Basically, we, we would become afraid and that fear was a messenger to us that something in, envir in our environment needs to be other than how it is, okay? So, so the Buddha got this, but here's where he went wrong. The, the third noble truth, it's, it's kind of like a non-